If you could all be with me in a 12th grade classroom, try and remember how interesting and new everything is at that age. Pina Colada, baby. That's right, it's 1980, Escape With Me, Hip Hughes history, to the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan, and really the Reagan Revolution, and uh, kind of a huge realignment in American politics. So what we're going to do, uh, if you haven't done these before, guys, we're going to take like 10 minutes, something like that, and chop, 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 chop. We're going to chop up that election and try to explain it to you kind of in uh, just regular old human language talk and understanding. Um, this is great for maybe an AP government student out there in TV land. Maybe you're lost in a college freshman class or you're just kind of a weirdo online. Whatever. We're going to grow your brain right now. So let's look at the kind of the major elements first, kind of like an opening paragraph, right? So who are we looking at? Well, first we're looking at the incumbent presidency. Remember, incumbency comes a lot of kind of benefits to that. You have Jimmy Carter, right, former governor of Georgia, kind of pushed in through, you know, kind of a lot of cynicism that people were feeling from Watergate. So now it's 1980, he's four years in. And he's back, right? Ronald Reagan, who challenged uh, Gerald Ford in 1976, is kind of like the expected front runner, and he's going to be the uh, nominee for the Republicans. And they are the two that are going to go at it. Um, two big issues of the day, and we're going to break this down and probably talk about some other issues. Um, basically, the economy and Iran. Like, those are the really, really big ones that are kind of on the front burners in this election. Um, let's just look really quick at some interesting things kind of as a preface to the major race. One of them would be that uh, Jimmy Carter had a major challenge in the primary. Now, if we looked at this cycle, you saw that um, the Republicans um, had a primary, right, because they didn't have a, a, a nominee, so you um, saw really one of the most negative primary races in the history of the universe, um, as kind of Romney and Gingrich and uh, uh, Perry, and you had Bachman in there, and you had, uh, what, uh, Santorum, and Kane, and, you know, uh, of course, but Ron Paul, um, all those guys, and it really kind of attacking each other for, you know, a good two or three months as Obama was like, chill, baby, baby, and being all swag. And that's because nobody really, nobody did challenge him. Um, Carter didn't have that luxury, and that's a big, big idea. He's going to have his own kind of, you know, arrows to pull out from the challenges the Democratic Party is going to um, um, go after him with. Um, there were a couple people that actually kind of ran in the primary against Jimmy Carter, Jerry Brown, former governor, now governor again of uh, California, um, and the big one was from Ted Kennedy, kind of to the left of Carter, kind of representing progressives and liberals and kind of how upset they were with Carter's, you know, kind of like slow decision making and pragmatism when they thought that, you know, you needed bold action. So uh, that was kind of a pain in the, pain in the ass, pain in the ass for Carter. And uh, certainly it caused him a lot of damage. And even at the convention, there was something called the Draft Muskie, uh, Edmund Muskie uh, movement, which sought to, at the last minute, get delegates to change their minds. So Carter's bruise going into this election, where Reagan, it's kind of the opposite idea, really doesn't have that much challenge. Um, his one challenger he picked to be his vice president, which is George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, the, the elder um, statesman George Bush. And... Uh, the only kind of thing I could think of is I know at the convention or when they were fighting in the primary that um, George Bush Sr. had called Ronald Reagan's economic programs uh, uh, voodoo economics, criticizing kind of trickle-down economics and kind of supply-side economics, which we'll, we'll probably kind of have to go over in a minute here. Um, all right, so let's just kind of get into it. There are other candidates. Let's throw those at you really quick. First, you have John Anderson. Um, John Anderson, kind of a moderate Republican from out west, who ran in the primary against uh, Reagan and really sees Reagan kind of as being too extreme. And that's one of the big ideas in this election is it's really like a realignment and dealignment of voters. So if you're kind of a conservative Democrat or a liberal Republican, you don't know what the hell to do in 1980. So John Anderson decided, ah, screw it, I'll run as an independent. And although he had a lot of kind of support in the beginning, um, that support really kind of got peeled away to the Carter and the Reagan camps. I think Anderson ended up with like 7% of the vote or something like that. Kind of the last breath of Republican moderatism kind of in a, in a primary, in a, or at least in a, I'm sorry, in an election. Um, you also had Libertarians running. Uh, libertarians, uh, I know the vice president candidate was uh, Koch. And I think Ed Clark was the, was the nominee in 1980. And libertarianism kind of, again, kind of a Western phenomenon, but not really only, um, kind of peaked up in 76. 
those guys are going to get a million votes um, by 1980. And what's interesting, another kind of like side note is, you know, that is the David Koch from the Koch brothers, who today is a huge um, Republican donor, um, you know, super PAC money, and he's kind of the, you know, the money man behind uh, kind of the Tea Party and the right wing. Um, but back then, he, you know, promoted uh, low-tax liberalism is what I think he called it. Really not dealing with social issues, really kind of going after that kind of that libertarian economic money idea that, uh, you know, against the income tax and uh, uh, wanting to see really kind of the abolishment of the, of the, of the tax system. So libertarianism um, and independence run in 1980, but it's not going to matter because Reagan is going to hit this one out of the park. Yeah, it's not even close, guys. 489 to, uh, what, like 89 or something like that. It's a blowout. So uh, during the campaign, let's kind of break down the issues really quickly for you. Um, number one, the economy, right? The economy, you're a sitting duck. If the economy is either neutralized or going down, like you're a dead duck if you're, if you're in that driver's seat. Just ask um, the, the senior George Bush. He had, I think, a 90% approval rating when we invaded Iraq or um, Kuwait or whatever in the first Persian Gulf War. Um, he lost the election because the economy was on the downturn. I think Clinton's advisors had a uh, sign said, it's the economy, stupid. So Carter, it's the economy, stupid. And whether it's his fault or not is for the political, the political ideologues out there to argue about. Um, but definitely inflation, definitely high gas prices, um, definitely kind of a feeling, I think even when, you know, 68, 70 were around, of kind of the country on a downward spiral. And that's only kind of heaten by events like, like Watergate and like, uh, you know, other stuff that went down. But the big idea here is the economy is not going well. One of Reagan's kind of biggest quips is in the third debate where he says, you know, just ask yourself, are you better now than you were four years ago? So that becomes a very infamous line in the debate. Um, other stuff, definitely Iran. If you don't know Iran, just, you need to, I ran home because I couldn't finish the test. Yeah, Iran, big time. Um, towards, I'm going to get the years wrong, but definitely the end of the Carter presidency, maybe a year and a half before the election. Um, uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, who was a religious leader, a spiritual leader in Iran, led a revolution. And... Um, the Shah of Iran, this is kind of complicated, but you can watch another lecture on this, I guess. Um, the Shah of Iran was kind of like sickly, and as the revolution was occurring, um, they really were seeking the Shah, the king, out, uh, who was a Western kind of influence power, um, to really get him, to capture him, kind of like, you know, Mubarak in Egypt, or it's a different idea, but same idea. So the United States, with Jimmy Carter, accepted the Shah in, um, for, I think, cancer treatments into uh, Mount Sinai or somewhere, a big hospital in America, and that really outraged Iran. They saw that as kind of us interfering with their sovereignty. So they stormed the embassy, and they captured 50 American hostages. And those 50 American hostages were held for 444 days. I think that's the number. Um, and they weren't released until actually Inauguration Day when Reagan took over in January of 81. Coincidence? You figure it out. But nevertheless, man, what a drag on Carter. And, you know, if there's nothing, if you can't fix a crisis, you're a dead duck. And uh, he's a dead duck. He tried to rescue them, kind of like an Obama-style bin Laden get you mission. Like helicopters crashed in the desert. Um, and he just couldn't negotiate himself out. So he definitely, the economy's dragging him down. He looks weak. Um, he's, you know, not, uh, liberals aren't happy. The base isn't happy. He's, he's going he's gonna to get it out of the park. Yeah, it's not going to be good. Um, other stuff, you know, definitely kind of demographically, if we look at the map up here, you know, it's just, whoosh, it's just all red. I think Carter won seven states, uh, a little group up there in kind of the, you know, the, the Rhode Island uh, area up here. And I think he won Minnesota and maybe uh, Hawaii, you know, some uh, Minnesota, I said that, a couple states like that. But for the most part, it's a de-alignment, realignment election because really you're going to see all of that Southern Democrat, unless you're Bill Clinton, Democrats are not going to win the South. Um, and really that's because it becomes a value-orientated gig. Now, Reagan want, ran a masterful campaign. He really, really did. Um, kind of like very positive as Carter attacked him for being extreme. You know, he was going to dismantle Social Security and, you know, the New Deal and the great society. He was just too far off for America. So he had a negative uh, economy. He had a negative foreign affair thing going on, and he's running a negative campaign. When um, Reagan doesn't have any of that baggage, you know, and he's like, you know, uh, you know, like a character on TV that everybody likes. 
and he played that masterfully. Um, Carter would attack him, and he would go, there you go, going on and on. You know, he just had this really folksy way of kind of attacking Carter and staying positive. And that's really what won him the election with a big idea. Take all those Southern kind of Democrats, right? Those Southern Democrats, a lot of them are evangelistic Christians who went overwhelmingly with Carter. Religion, really, that silent majority, is now going to suck those voters into the Republican Party. Jerry Faldwell and uh, was it the Moral Majority, I always get that organization, really, really far conservative, you know, religious kind of stuff going on. And you can think whatever you want, but, you know, really, 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 really religious. And uh, they backed Reagan. So that's when that change occurred. So now, you know, unless you're a really progressive evangelistic Christian and you're into the environment and maybe helping poor people, you're voting Republican. You know, if you don't think about those things or abortion is your, your, your cup of tea for an issue or school prayer or they're trying to take God out of, you know, America, you're voting Republican. And that's Reagan's doing. He, I don't know how religious he is, but masterfully he's aligning himself with those D-aligned Democratic voters. Now they're going to go, they're called Reagan Democrats, and they are now Republicans. Like maybe 20 seconds on the ERA, the failed amendment, the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, this is really, again, that moral majority and anti-feminism that rears its head for the first time in the Republican Party. And for 40 years they supported the ERA and they pulled that support. And even though Reagan kind of says he's for women's rights, um, it's really kind of a, a, a change in, in kind of the platform of the Republican Party. But there's other stuff to learn, definitely. Mm. Um, other stuff that might, we might kind of want to get into, the NRA, you know, interest groups really, and money and politics starts rearing its head. Um, they um, endorse Reagan for the first time. The NRA now is going to be kind of with Republicans forever and ever and ever. Um, my brain is racing a million miles an hour. Uh, I think those are the main ideas. If you get that idea of Reagan kind of, you know, riding, you know, a triumphant positive campaign and those long coattails. So we're going to get a Republican uh, Congress, Senate and House. Reagan's going to have the pick of the letter. Really, uh, um, quickly, his economic policies are not Keynesian. Um, they're not, you know, the idea of the government pumping money to create jobs. They are actually the opposite, trickle-down economics, kind of the idea that you give tax cuts to the wealthy. That's, it's the, I know libertarians say it's an argument about liberty, but for these guys, it's an argument about economic wealth and how you create opportunity, whether you believe it or not. But that when you give tax cuts to the rich, they're going to expand their businesses and they're going to create jobs for people who need jobs. That's how you create jobs. If you're a Keynesian, you argue that, look, you know, corporations and businesses today have more money than they've ever had in the history of the world, and they're not hiring people. So therefore, the government has to kind of, you know, invest in teachers and government jobs and projects and highways and bridges, and that money gets pumped into the bottom of the kind of the, you know, balloon of America, and then they spend that money, and then businesses create jobs because there's higher um, demand. Economics, ah, I'm not picking a side. I'm just saying, those are your, your options, kind of. So, Reagan versus Carter, it's over, baby. It's over. And Reagan's going to be a two-termer. You can look at the Reagan in 10-minute lecture. Um, I could talk for a billion years. Roller derby, baby. All right, get into it. My wife is one of the co-founders of uh, QCRG, Queen City Roller Girls in Buffalo. So support your local derby league. That's my plug for the day. But you can go to QCRG.net and check out their videos and... Um, guess who makes those, but roller derby's awesome. Junior roller derby, girls hitting girls and being athletic. Kick butt, baby. All right, we're done. It's Reagan. See you later, guys, all right? Good luck studying. There are many ways to conduct post-film activities profitably. The objective should always be to use the film as a springboard to learning, understanding, and creating.